Definition. Welcome everybody to the Zoning Board of Appeals public hearing, March 12th, 2024. Uh, let me just motion to um, commence the meeting. Can I have a second? Sorry. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And Joyce Aye. is here. So with us we have board members Julia McCormick, Tom Kempner, Luke Ferrin, and via Zoom uh, we have Joyce Jifra. And uh, we have our legal counsel. Brian Stoller and our environmental consultant Chick Voorhees with us uh, this evening. Also via Zoom, we have Alex Wallach. Um, can we see Alex? I'm here. Can you see me? Okay? There we are. Yeah, now okay. we can. Thank you. And uh, we're ready to go through our agenda, which is first, we are still working on the written decision with respect to case number 3144, Stephen Hickey. So we can move on to our. Uh, first carryover case uh, on our agenda, which is case number 3147, Andrew Fleiss, 64 Down East Lane. And Tom Kempner is recused. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Carl Benacasa, 860 Montauk Highway, Watermill, New York, for the applicant. Um, We've been on several times. I think it was adjourned last just for Mr. Voorhees to inspect the fact and just to bring everyone up to date. Um, this was submitted originally applied for back in, I think it was the summer of last year. Uh, in the interim, it was discovered that there was a buffer that was imposed by a previous variance on the property. That buffer had been um, had been mowed into and cultivated against the terms of the buffer. Uh, we had asked for a revised buffer. Ultimately, it was decided that we would just replant the buffer pursuant to the terms of the 2000 variance. That was done, and we were just waiting for Mr. Voorhees to confirm that. The building department had previously confirmed it, but uh, naturally the board wanted your environmental consultant to do it. And I believe Mr. Voorhees was there last week. Do you want to speak that, to this? Sure, yes. <laughs> um, apologies for not being able to attend the last meeting. Um, I did visit the site on March 5th. It was a lovely <laughs> day with rain and winds out of the east. Uh, met the owner briefly and uh, visited the back of the property. <clears throat> and what I found was that the buffer, as it had been designed by um, Aris Design uh, for the prior permit, <clears throat> has been revegetated at this time. Um, and it, it looks quite good, particularly since it is during the winter. Uh, we do typically have some type of performance uh, to monitor uh, buffers so that they do revegetate properly. But I didn't see anything out of order, uh, with a small exception of a little bit of gully erosion that's coming off one of the landscape beds closest to the area where the break is in the fence to access the proposed future dock. And I brought that to the applicant's attention and they're gonna address it through landscaping. It was very minor, but with all the heavy rains we've had, there's kind of a, um, almost like a little gully uh, at the edge of the, not the restored buffer, but the edge of the landscape bed. And it's getting sediment and uh, erosion into the wetland area. Very small amount of material was there. Looks like it could easily be uh, tuned up. And that was my recommendation. Uh, so I know we do have a pending permit for a um, catwalk to access the waterway. Um, I don't know if there are questions about that, but we do have plans. Um, one of my concerns at a prior meeting was the presence of the kayak rack within actually spanning the wetlands and the buffer. Uh, and it's, it's actually part of the natural buffer. Uh, and the applicant has removed that. And we do have plans that show it without that. Uh, the applicant is also proposing a, call it a fairly small expansion of the buffer, uh, but it is an expansion nevertheless, and it was justified through a calculation of the square footage um, to uh, come up with an additional two-foot uh, buffer that would be added to what is there. So when you take the cumulative square footage across the width of the property, it's, you know, it's a pretty good amount. Um, we're just talking about the recreational pier. We've had many discussions about the configuration of the end of that pier, the terminus, uh, and how it may or may not affect the um, 
property across the waterway. Uh, I think that that has all been resolved uh, just in terms of minimal sizing, uh, orientation, depth of water, and allowing through flow decking so that vegetation underneath uh, the structure can uh, flourish. So at this point, I don't have any other questions. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions uh, the board may have and um, you know, follow your direction for the next step. Um, I can confirm uh, what Mr. Voorhees says, that we are no longer <clears throat> requesting relief for the proposed kay kayak rack that's been removed from uh, the application and the proposal. And in addition to the, um, the permit for the dock, we are simply requesting relief of side yard setback for this accessory structure uh, to 10 feet where 35 feet is required. Again, the, the reason we're doing it where it is is because it's closest to navigable waters and provides limited disturbance to the buffer and wetlands. And that's why we are asking. We have received comments from one neighbor who's represented here tonight. Uh, we have not, uh, we have no opposition from the neighbor Im most impacted by the side yard setback. And I believe uh, Ms. Reichert will speak, but her, uh, her client's most concerned with the positioning of the uh, dock itself. Um, the concern was whether we would be uh, docking boats permanently, motorized vehicles permanently. We are willing to, by covenant, if, if required by this board, uh, confirm that we will um, we will only use um, essentially put the docks at, put, use the dock for loading and unloading of the motorized vehicles of motorized boats and keep the boats out of mooring further in the in the, uh, in the in the bay. So maybe Check I've given away too this, much before she spoke. Um, what's the uh, benefit detriment analysis on the variance um, relief from 35 feet to 10 feet? Uh, well, that would be up to the applicant to present um, just in terms of uh, an area relief um, requirement. From the environmental standpoint and the wetlands permit standpoint, there is already a um, pathway that has um, gone through uh, the wetland and the buffer area that's there now. And uh, as Mr. Benacasa said, uh, this area of the property would provide the widest and deepest access to the waterway. Uh, so at least from an environmental standpoint, I think the alignment makes sense. Uh, the applicant may want to touch on the five tests since there is a area variance involved. Uh, but environmentally, we have looked at that and feel it's the best alignment. Through the um, numerous hearings we've had, I think we've touched on the five tests. I, I would think most important would be consideration of the client's riparian rights, which supersede uh, local zoning and give him a bit access to the um, navigable waterways. Uh, this was the way to do it with um, least impact to the environs and quickest access to those navigable waterways because the uh, heady creek dries up very quickly as you go further east from this property. So we're saying that if it was 35 feet in accordance with the, the, the setback that you wouldn't really have access to Shinnecock Bay navigable water? We'd have to disturb more wetlands to get to the navigable water. This is the most direct route. Chick, uh, did you just say that there is a pathway right now where the dock is proposed? Yes. The client does have access to the water now. It's not via a dock, correct? To the water, but not necessarily navigable waterways. And that's where the dock, that's where the riparian rights come in. <clears throat> in the sense that they might have to get wet to get to a boat? Well, you, you, you're allowed to have access, to, your boat to have access to navigable waterways. Yes. To depth for the boat to be launched and, and to be berthed. Well, I don't, I don't understand. The, the boat can go to where the access is currently, right? I guess what I'm getting at is not all uh, accessory structures are, do are docks, but every dock is an accessory structure, right? So it's not really an infringement on riparian rights when he already does have access to the water. This, I, I guess riparian rights do not require a dock. It requires access. You're okay. right. This would be an, an enhancement and, an, and, a, and a, 
and heightened ability to obtain the riparian rights. But putting aside the riparian rights, I think when looking at the five-part test, the detriment to the uh, surroundings versus the benefit to the applicant, uh, it, it disturbs less of his property and impacts less of the wetlands. It's a clearer, more direct route to navigable water. It's a better, safer way for him to store his uh, boats and to access that water. And the neighbor, which is most burdened by the access, has, has um, been advised of this and has not offered any opposition. I'm not saying I disagree with you on that, but I feel like you have couched the riparian rights uh, issue in a way that you would try to make the case that if we were to deny the, the dock, you would say we would have infringed upon his riparian rights. And I just want you to put on the record that that's not what you're doing. And you do understand that he does have access to the water, navigable water, as is. And a, and a denial of the dock does not infringe upon his pre-existing access. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I can waive any legal arguments he may have without speaking with him. I'm not asking you to waive any legal arguments. I'm just asking you to acknowledge the truth of the matter. Which, and, and that would be? That there is no, this isn't really about riparian rights, because he has those rights. He does have riparian rights. Okay. Yes. Yes. And whether there's a dot, you've said that the riparian right is for him to access navigable water. That's correct. And he does have that access right now, right? To navigable water? Uh, I, I think that involves a more thorough analysis of the property conditions and the where his property line ends and where the navigable waters begin. But according to Mr. Voorhees, there is a path there. Right. That path conflicts with the terms of that buffer. And we bring up riparian rights just to note that the buffer cannot impede the access. And I think what you're trying to say is that we might not need a dock to exercise our riparian rights. I can't say whether that's the case or not, but it could be the case. Yes. How many months into this application are we, and we haven't figured that out? Well, it's it's never been questioned before. Sure. Okay. Alex, can can you put up? Are you able to put up a, a an aerial? Just I want to see what it looks like if the dock was conforming at thirty five feet compared to the ten feet. I know we looked at this months and months ago, but do you have access to an aerial <clears throat> that we could look at? Uh, yes. Just give me one moment. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. It would be great if you could make it full screen, if possible. All right, let me see what I can do. So as you see from the plans, the dock is in approximately this vicinity, <laughs> this yellow line running north-south is the property line. I think, Alex, perhaps that photo is taken at a very low tide. The, the dock is north of there a little bit. Uh, potentially. I, I don't, obviously, I don't know the tide from this photo was taken. I'm just showing it in relation to the, the property line. Right. Sure. So is there a way to show an estimate of where 10 feet is and where 35 feet is and what the what the detriment is, well, what the benefit is to the applicant? I just want to understand that why why moving it over 25 feet is is a benefit. This to move it about 35 feet. I'm sorry, Alex, could you repeat that? This this red dashed line here that I just measured mm -hmm. is approximately uh, 35 feet. Okay. So we, we put the dock in the vicinity of where my mouse is, if you're able to see that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I'm not yet. Saying, what's the What's yeah. the year of this? This is this is a this was, this was two year old picture. 
So the buffer hadn't been replanted at that point. Correct. There's a lot that this picture isn't showing. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's fair to. Do you have any, any illustration of the benefit? I know we're, what you're saying, but I just wanted to see it. On the benefit versus, I don't oh, have an the, illustration of, of showing it. Rather than 35 feet. I don't, no, I don't have an analysis of it at 35 feet. You've only done the analysis based on the 10 feet. Mr. Walker, who's presumably on his way, would probably have a better sense of it. Alex, do you have any of Inner Science's uh, previous submissions that you could put up? Potentially, yes. Alex, I think you have to go back to last month's folder. Okay. Luke, can I ask you to just to clarify the point that you were making, because what you're saying is that because the path is there, which will lead to the shore, mm -hmm. that there is access at that at the shore to being able to put a boat or a kayak in. Correct. Uh, I, I mean, mean it I'll doesn't go, need. I'll go one step further and okay. say that the the homeowner owns waterfront property. He doesn't even need a path. He's allowed to walk to his water mm -hmm. and when these riparian rights issues were uh, first contemplated, probably over 100 years ago, right? They didn't parse what getting to navigable water really meant. Do your feet get wet or do they not? Right. There's probably someone who needed to go out into the bay and fish. There's and, been case law since it was originally established. And I submitted a memo mm -hmm. to this board so, you know, yeah. perhaps a year ago. Uh, and uh, again, Carl, I'm not like, I'm. don't take this as me weighing in one way or another on the dock. I just want to make sure that the, <clears throat> my opinion is that the riparians, riparian rights argument is kind of the wrong route here. And that doesn't do anything for me. Um, well, it has to be made for several reasons. One of which is that buffer. Because mm -hmm. without riparian rights, we need to amend the buffer to allow access mm -hmm. because of the riparian rights which trump we don't that 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 buffer is subject to the riparian rights and that, that's why this argument essentially was made from the very beginning so to get past that buffer which did not account for access mm -hmm. we have to discuss riparian rights and the reason the dock was positioned where it is because the more west you get on heady creek the more navigable the water and I think that's the benefit to the applicant. And if you look at other aerials, and I don't know if um, Alex has them handy, you'll see over time that the western, se the eastern sections of Hetty Creek get very dry at times. Um, and uh, it's why the neighbor across the street stock is positioned where it is. Sure. Um, I mean, certainly what's been news to me tonight is that there's an intent to have motorized vehicles there. Mm -hmm. Sure, access, but not to be stored there. That was. But then you get into okay, what is storage? Does it have to be moored every night? Are there going to be some weekends where it's going to stay out there? You know, are, are you going to turn the neighbors into the watchdogs on this? I think it would be transient, transient, and uh, never stored, other than unloading and unloading, and that's perfectly fine with the applicant. The dock across the way has no restrictions on their use. Right. Right. Okay. So let's just say they're going to take their larger motorboat out. Someone's going to go get the tender. It's going to bring them back. It's going to take everyone out to the boat. <clears throat> the dinghy will stay moored. Now everyone comes home. Everyone gets dropped off. The dinghy immediately gets returned to the mooring. Mm -hmm. What if the boat, like, that's a pretty big commitment to make. From, well, you, you kayak or you um, paddle board out to the boat, get the dinghy, come back and you know, it's done and he's willing to do it. And he has a very interested neighbor that I'm sure will 
notify the town immediately if he's not. Right. And do we even want to get into that? No, we'd rather not have any limitations on it, right. but we're willing, we're willing to do it uh, for the sake of the neighborhood. Jake, just for the record, would you would you uh, agree that that the benefit to the applicant by having the the um, the dock ten feet from the property line or twenty five feet to the west is that that increases their access to navigable water? That if they were twenty five feet to the east, that the water is, I guess, more shallow and less navigable. Is that what we're saying? As a matter of fact. I would agree with that. I'm looking at soundings of the creek right now, as well as the uh, orientation of mean low water. And uh, 10 feet from the property line is a little bit wider and a little bit deeper, and it narrows and gets more shallow as you go uh, farther up the creek. Any other board members have questions? Joyce, do you have any questions? No, I think I think I'm good for right now. Okay, do we does any member of the public wish to be heard? Thank you, members of the board. My name is Martha Riker, Tumi Latham Shea, Kelly Dubin Quartararo, 33 West 2nd Street, Riverhead, New York. Uh, I represent the owner of 405 Captain Max, Captain's Neck Lane. And you know, we've we've all been here several times before, and so I think that over the course of the application, um, you know, we've been in discussion with the applicant's representatives, and, um, you know, I think that it would be actually helpful if Alex could pull up the screen just so that we could see the shape of my client's property, because one of the things that, you know, often doesn't get taken into account is the fact that our property lines extend across the creek adjacent to to this same shoreline. Alex, and, can, can you show that? That is it a survey, Martha, that we should look at? No, even if he just pulls up GIS. Okay. If we could do, this is near maps, perhaps if we could do GIS, the 2022 aerial. And, you know, just, just to go back, when, when this application was first presented, we discussed, you know, there was a history that this sort of little Part of, of Hetty Creek is really a dug drainage canal, right, pursuant to an easement, which accounts for these, these property lines. Um, as you can see, this is my client's property over here as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, I've, I've discussed with, with Mr. Benincasa, with Mr. Walker several times, you know, I think that we respect the riparian rights that every waterfront owner has. And this is a little bit of a unique circumstance because of the dug channel. But that being said, our primary concerns have always been preserving navigability on the creek because it's very narrow. Um, you know, and to that end, the dock design has been reconfigured and is smaller. It doesn't actually cross over the property line. And so I think that for us with this board, you have to make your own decisions. But I think that Luke has raised some valid concerns about how the dock will be used, the impact on navigation, and the wetlands as well. And I think that if you look at just this low tide, example here this is an extreme low tide i i suspect <laughs> but it does show that you know if if a boat was to be berthed for any long period of time at low tide it would be sitting on the marsh it would be sitting on the bottom and that has an environmental impact so while my client has a personal interest in preserving um, his navigation and his navigability and thinks that a covenant restricting you know birthing beyond you know passenger drop off and pick up, et cetera, um, would help preserve navig navigability. We also believe that that restriction has an environmental benefit only because of the fact that the, the marshland and the underwater lands are readily exposed where the dock area will be at low tides, especially lunar tides. And that's really my, my only comment is that, you know, we'd like to see that covenant put into place um, my client doesn't want to be the watchdog, so I think that if the village also has some skin in the fight because of a covenant that runs to it, that that will just help sort of provide guardrails for good neighborly behavior. What, excuse me, what covenant are you suggesting? 
a, a covenant restriction that's recorded that runs with the land that sort of pursuant to the approval for the dock would limit um, birthing of boats to, you know, something temporary in nature for passenger pickup and drop off. We've submitted a letter to the record before sort of outlining that. Um, and, uh, you know, and would prevent birthing at, at low tide, right, just to minimize impacts to the bottomlands and the wetlands. And my understanding earlier tonight was that a covenant was agreed to. I think the applicant is willing to do it yeah. if this board so requires it. And that's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Chick, should boats with motorized propellers be this close to the shoreline? I would have concerns about that. Typically, when we talk about a kayak dock, it's for non-motorized vessels. It's for kayaks. It's for paddle boards, perhaps a small canoe. Um, you know, you're not going to get access there at anything other than mid to high tide. Right. Uh, there's only six-tenths of a foot of water at low tide in the deepest part of that uh, area. So I definitely would have concerns over that. But what covenant would protect against that? Well, I think we're talking about a covenant for no permanent birthing of boats. Um, and, you know, if we have to add no motorized vessels, that might be something that would take care of that. Perhaps an electric motor or something like that would be minimal because you can pull it out very easily. It's very small and you can, you know, not have to row or paddle. Right. Or like a jet boat, too. Yeah, they don't really draw that much water. They don't have the deep protruding propeller right. that you would get with other types of uh, vessels. Does anyone else have allergies? I apologize for my voice tonight. <laughs> it's, it's hard to talk. <clears throat> Jeff, I have some in the car. I'll try okay. and get it after this. Okay. Did you want to add more? No. Okay, where, where do we want to leave this? Adjourn for all purposes or close for decision? I'm ready to close for decision. Luke, what's your inclination? Um, I think we have to have some discussion about it, and, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think everyone has said everything they need to say. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I do have, I mean, I have open questions about, we could always require the covenant after we close for decision. We can always issue a decision with reasonable conditions. I think for right now, we're basically deciding whether or not we need any more information from the applicant or anybody else in order to render a decision. So I think that's leaning toward closing the decision. Yeah, agreed. Joyce, where, where are you? Can, can I make a motion to close for decision? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, so I'll motion to close can for decision. Joyce, was that you? No, no. Sorry, that's me, Alex. Oh, okay. yes, Alex. <laughs> And just, I can't speak for uh, the village code enforcement, but I, obviously there's no uh, village road here that accesses part of the creek. Um, if there were, were a covenant, I'm curious how the village might uh, enforce that. Um, obviously, we don't have access to the, the neighbor's dock unless they were to grant permission for, for the code enforcement to, to access it. So just something for consideration. Is that our consideration? No, it's it's how, how could we possibly enforce it? But right. but again, if, if it's part of our decision, right? You know, if we find that we can't enforce it, but it's so critical, you know, it could influence whether or not we grant the dock. Right. Um, but I'll, I'll motion to close for all purposes to close for decision. Case number three one four seven Andrew Fleiss, sixty four Down East Lane. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Joyce, Aye. are you with us? Okay. Yes. So we move on to uh, a motion to approve the request by the applicant for adjournment of case number 3156. Okay. Sorry. 3156 2020 Meadow Lane uh, to April 9th, 2024. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor of uh, accepting the applicant's request to adjourn to April 9th, 2024. Please say aye. 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 And we then have a motion to accept the applicant's request to adjourn case number 3155-1750 Waterview LLC-1750 Meadow Lane to adjourn that to our meeting in April, April 25th, 2024. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor of accepting the applicant's request for an adjournment, please say aye. 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 
I, I'd um, like to note, though, that uh, we were asked by the applicant to submit materials to them quickly after the last meeting, which we, I believe, were delivered in a timely fashion. And we had taken some uh, admonishment for the fact that we had taken too much time. And I just want to note the fact that we did deliver the materials, and now we're being asked again for another adjournment. The applicant, the, uh, the Nelson Pope and Voorhees, took two months. I'm sorry, John Bennett. I apologize. John Bennett for the applicant. Nelson Pope and Voorhees took two months, two months, two months to give us the latest um, now 20 page uh, report, all of which, which to attempts, and, that, and what I can only say is a, a, a very quizzical fashion, to refute everything of the prior reports that they gave. So this is not foot dragging on our part, far from it. It's taking the appropriate amount of time. We have to go back up to our, 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 our man up in Woods Hole to further respond. So no foot drag. And, and also, you remember, this is the one where it took some quite a bit of time for you to schedule it uh, based upon some paperwork foul up, which didn't seem to come from this board, but rather from the building department. So and finally, there's no prejudice to the board. Uh, usually people complain, complain about a, uh, an, an adjournment if there's some prejudice to them. There's no prejudice to the board. So we think no, it's a more we don't, we don't feel prejudice. We just, at the last meeting, understood from, from uh, Rich Warren that he wanted our report as quickly as possible. I think you had the report when? Um, it was March 1st. We had the report to you on March 1st because I said yeah. at the meeting, I will encourage delivery of the report as quickly as possible. We talked about then meeting today, you know, if we had the report to you soon enough, and we were just a little bit surprised that I don't know why you'd be surprised. I, it was a 25-page report. I pushed to have the report delivered, and then we're not only adjourning to the next meeting, which would be um, April 9th, but you asked for an adjournment to April 25th, which is fine. We're not. Okay, we thanks. Feel, it's we fine. We don't feel prejudiced. It's fine. We just don't Thank feel you. as if the right. applicant should then, you know, talk and, to us about how we're delaying. And I just think, and I appreciate the adjournment of the 25th, don't get me wrong, I don't, I just, I, my concern with the admonishment is it doesn't take into account the fact that this is a 25 page report that was, there was a two month delay, it impacts uh, on reports uh, and positions taken in our, this almost year long process. And we have to go back, for example, to our, our, our people at Woods Hole. And that's not something that we can be turned around quickly. So the reason I asked for the 25th, which I think is more than fair and more than adequate and not prejudice to anybody, uh, is to make sure that we had sufficient amount of time and that we could get in turn get our report to you. Remember the 25th, but remember we, we also have to get that does you would be unhappy if we gave you our response on the on the 24th. So of course I would. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so we're trying to be fair to everybody. Okay, so we, do we have the motion to um, thank you uh, did I pass to adjourn to April 25th and we passed zero. Thank uh, you. That's on the record. Great. Um, thank you. So now we're ready for uh, case number 3151 Alexander de Pisa 213 Windmill Lane. Thank you. Uh, John Bennett for the applicant. Mr. Pisa is here as is Bailey Larkin from my office. Uh, at the last hearing we had presented a revised site plan and architectural plans with the board. Uh, although the amended plans did not amend the request for relief the dimensional setback request remains the same. Mr. Pisa had modified the proposed residence to reduce the total gross floor area proposed by approximately 406 square feet. Now, I'm being very specific as to why we did this. Mr. Farron said, look, we understand that there's no GFA in the, um, in the uh, OD zone. However, could you take that into consideration insofar as although there is no uh, gross floor area requirement, there is um, it is a residence. Uh, so despite the fact that there is no issue with the uh, um, with the FAR, because there is none, uh, we were very uh, aware of, of, of Luke's request, and we did so. We, so we sharpened our pencil, and we removed 416 square feet um, from the uh, from the application. Now this is a two two family residence on in a village, and the village re law requires that you have 20,000 square feet of, uh, of uh, 
uh, there's a 20,000 square feet per unit in effect density requirement where you want to have um, a, a multiple family uh, house. It was interesting that, um, and what we're doing here is we're taking this significantly non-conforming use, which is a two uh, family house, and we're asking uh, to build a single family house. So right off the bat, we're, we're reducing the lack of conformity by uh, 20,000 square feet. What's interesting is uh, at the house on the corner, it's right across the street from my office, uh, it's the, uh, on the corner of White and uh, Windmill. On the, that's, I guess, what's that's the southwest corner. This board very recently allowed, uh, in effect, the doubling of the density, allowed that house to be, it was an office at some time. Uh, it, was an, it was a house many, many years ago when I was a kid, uh, and then it became Eric Woodward's office uh, and then it became a doctor's office, and then there was the uh, it was allowed to the board allowed uh, a, redu a reduction in the density requirement on that parcel uh, to have a uh, in effect a an apartment and uh, and maintain the office. And now, uh, just recently, the board allowed in effect the doubling of the density on that by allowing. Uh, uh, in effect, two, uh, a, a, a two-story house. So what were so you allowed an increase in the degree of nonconformity, a significant increase in the degree of nonconformity. Here we're asking to decrease the nonconformity as it relates uh, to density. You'll remember, as I demonstrated at the last meeting, and went through the OD uh, special exception standards for a, uh, a residence, and I won't bore you with those. We submitted them in writing, uh, and I already gave you that uh, <coughs> verbally at the last meeting. Uh, that this is uh, a use that is permitted upon special exception. That's the actual real terminology. It's very important that the board, let me, um, if I may, share some of my understanding uh, with you. Uh, a, a special exception approval is not like a variance. A special exception approval is a finding by the legislature, in, in this case the, uh, t the village trustees, that it is a use that should be permitted, but is permitted upon special exception, which means that they want uh, a little bit more of a look taken at it, but it is, it is not a variance. I'm not asking for a deviation from the code uh, as it relates to the use and as it relates to the conformity. Of course, we want some dimensional uh, relief here. Um, now, um, one of the things that's been before, uh, and before I talk a little bit about where you take the setback. One of the things that's been before the board uh, is um, where you take the setback from. The south side of this uh, series of easements uh, uh, or the, the north side. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but I wanted to let you know, I did speak to, the, I did say to the building inspector based upon uh, some information that I've given to him about how the village has typically handled these things. And I'll talk to you a little bit about, more about those. Uh, in, in, in a bit, I did ask the building inspector to take a look and, because there had been, on this very series of easements, there had been particularly at, um, at uh, uh, 205B, uh, uh, the, the uh, property to the west, there had been uh, improvements, and we demonstrated this uh, by a survey, uh, improvements where the the village took the setback from the south side of this easement. This uh, the access is among, amongst a series of easements. So um, Tin Hoso took the position that we had to take it from the north side. I put a very extensive letter into uh, to uh, the chief building inspector Chris Talbot, and he told me today, please uh, let the board know that he, it's still under consideration as to whether or not the uh, the um, setback should be taken from the south side or from the north side. I know there was some consternation that you had about that, uh, uh, Mr. Greenwald, but it is clearly within the powers and ability of the building inspector. Oh, no, I, I don't doubt that. Okay. Do you have the letter the, that John submitted the to Chris Talbot? Yes. If you don't have it, we can give Chris you copies of it. Well, I have a letter that you submitted to the board, which right. essentially outlines my arguments to Talbot, correct? Okay, and then we uh, submitted the, a similar uh, letter even before that to Talbot. I gave it to the board so the board could be aware of the um, back and forth that we were having with Mr. Talbot. Right. 
but that, so he's that, considering it. Did he give you a timeline on when he might? I asked him, and I I I know better than to push the building well, that, inspector. I'm, but it, no, he didn't. I'm glad he's looking at. Yeah, it. Yeah, he's looking at it. But I I I I I, I was hesitant to push him for a timeline. Gotcha. I, I had said to him a couple of weeks ago, it'd be nice if you had a determination before tonight, but at a certain point, I don't, I don't, I mean, he's, he's a busy guy and he's just trying to get a lot of people, not only himself, but a lot of people up to speed. Uh, so, um, yeah. So I, we I asked I just want to know if our, if our record is complete, the letter that you sent to Chris Talbot, the building inspector, do we have that in our files? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either. Uh, we can we'll submit that to you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's pretty much the same arguments, and I'll go through them that that we made to uh, to you in, in our recent letter. But so that you can be comfortable, what we submitted to Mr. Talbot, we will submit that to you with with all of the uh, in, 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 uh, with all of the uh, what am I looking for? What, what am I looking for? Attachments. Thank you. Hey, so, Alex, are you, are you there? Yes, I am. Do you have the letter? Um, I do not. Okay. But I, I'll make sure that uh, Chris Talbot also has uh, some sort of interpretation to explain um, if that's helpful. Well, no, I think, and I could be wrong, Mark, you're, you're not talking about Tin's letter, you're talking about oh, Chris's no, I have letter. Tin's letter. I'm, okay, I mean, yeah. The letter that you sent to TN, <coughs> right. Alex Wallach, our village planner, nor our legal counsel have it. So we, we just want them to have it. Not a problem, of course. More than happy to provide it. I just wanted to make sure it's, I thought, Alex's response was about Tin's letter. Yeah, Alex's yeah. response was that Chris should also have Tien's letter if he doesn't have it. Oh, I, I, he, he has it, but I'll, he should make sure he has it. Do you want John to read it in right now so we can... No, no, I, I, I think there's not a lot we can do tonight until Chris weighs in on this. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where I am. Okay. Can, can I give you some stuff? Of course. And, and then, but ultimately, I would agree with you. You can't really make a determination since part of the relief is, Bill, is still being... Uh, this up in, up in the air and may or may not meet, need relief from that. But just a couple things that I wanted to point out. And as it relates to that, one of the things, and I'll be very, very quick, because I, since we have to, going to have to put this forward, I don't want to take up too much of anybody's time. As I said, we did we, we did talk about uh, Janky, the owner of 25B, having uh, improvements that were taken from the Sodley side. We also did submit to the board, uh, to, well, we both submitted to the board and council, as well as to uh, Mr. Talbot, we do submit um, that whole series of everyone's everyone's very familiar with uh, uh, the fair, fairly uh, down at the very end of South Main Street. Same situation that fairly is ro road quote end quote that is not shown on a tax map as is this road and everyone along fairly uh, since there are properties on either side, everyone takes their setback from the middle of the road and their um, Lots are calculated based upon the fee out to the middle of the road. It's a fee subject, as it is here, it's a fee subject to uh, easements for pass and repass. So it, it appears to me that there's been a fairly consistent pattern in the village in these situations uh, where you don't, you take the setback from, from the property lines. But I'm going to, well, that's part of our argument to Chris. We gave him all the stuff about Fairly, we gave him the 25B. Uh, or 205B uh, survey, and he's considering that. I just wanted to let you know, for pur purposes of transparency, we gave it all to you, so there was, you can be aware of that. Um, so anyway, we have a situation here where um, I think this is a great thing. I think you've got somebody who has a two-family residence, which is supposed to have, under the village code, 40,000 square feet, 20,000 square feet per Per, per unit, we're significantly reducing the density. We're going to have all the modern. It's going to be built to modern uh, codes and specs. Uh, you know, of course, the new wastewater system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and all to the. I think to the to the on on questions benefit. I did have two letters uh, that the that the that the um, that the folks asked me to read into the record. So with from from the neighbors. So with your patience, I will do that. Uh, one of them is from Michael Janke, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be I'll be quick, but so I, I I'm sorry if I'm reading quickly. I'm just be, uh, very very aware of the board's time. Where is he relative to this property? He is directly to the west, abuts. He's an abutter. Okay. 
Uh, dear Chairman Greenwald and members of the board, I'm running to express my full support for the above reference application as further described the stated objections to this application by several of my neighbors lack any plausible foundation and instead propose to affirmatively harm not only PISA but my own property rights. Those objecting neighbors do not even attempt to secure my signature to the letters of opposition. The first I heard of those was at the last hearing. I have owned two houses on the enclave for 20 years, 215 Minwell Lane. I'm going to paraphrase, mm -hmm. just <laughs> forgive me. I'm not trying to leave anything salient out. 215 windmill and 205b. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I have thus decades of experience utilizing the 20 foot easements to my property and of having neighbors cross over my property by way of easements to get to their property. At no time, at no time during my 21 years of ownership has there been a single instance of difficulty of fire, ambulance, or police vehicle, vehicles navigating over the easements to reach any of the properties. Even when a contractor parked his truck on the easement next to 20, 205B, fire trucks were able to access my property 215. That was one of his, his prior property. Uh, unfortunately, needed on several occasions due to inadvertently triggered fire alarms. However, my home at 205 is even closer to these easements than Mr. Pisa's homes, hence any putative safety concerns with Mr. Pisa's proposal, sadly and undoubtedly used to frighten my elderly neighbor, Mrs. Etheridge, into supporting the objections are a complete red herring. Now remember, to the extent they're concerned about access for emergency vehicle e easements, the width of this easement exists, the width of its pavements exists. It would seem commonsensical that if you're having a one-family uh, uh, house as opposed to a two-family house that, um, um, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I'm, a, that I'm a traffic consultant, but it would suggest that you would have less likelihood for uh, emergency vehicle access need. But again, I, 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 I give that anecdotally so as well as, as, not, not, as not, not pretending to be a traffic expert. Um, in any event, you know something? I'll leave the rest of this. It becomes, it becomes rather, you, I'll let you read it for yourself. Essentially, it's a letter and so forth. I, I just have one quick question. Sure. On, on and again, that. I can't respond to his letter other than to you know, re read it in. I just decided that it's a two-page single-spaced letter. Who, consistent who, with time. Who, <laughs> who, who owns 205B? Uh, it appears like it's owned by Mr. Jenke. He represents that he is the owner, but he Joseph has a co-owner who spoke right. in opposition. Mm -hmm. So on the deed, they are both on the deed? I, I, I can only assume that. If you want, we can get a copy of the deed. Well, I mean, he's presenting himself as the owner, yeah, and so, yeah, is, yeah. so is Joseph <laughs> Beckwar and... Yeah, you know, let's get a copy of the deed. See sure what it says. How much it matters, but it's just a little confusing. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's 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 it is in forty two years of doing this the first time I've had one <laughs> joint tenant oppose and one the other joint tenant uh, the other uh, object. So you know, let's get the deed. And I'll I'll get the deed for you. The other one is from um, Sheila Selston who is the owner, uh, the great granddaughter, uh, and is obviously somewhere in the chain of title of the owner of 211 Windmill Lane, which is the property to the east. And there, she says her family has paid property taxes uh, on, on the property. Uh, and uh, the property's been in her family for over 100 years. Um, and she said that she has received written notice about Mr. Pisa's application, gives it her full support. I'm very pleased that Mr. Mr. Pisa is looking to improve the property. So, and then she talks about how she thinks it's inappropriate to take the setback from anything other than the Sudley uh, property line. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the entire uh, record to you all for your consideration. I just suffice to say they're both supportive of the application. Um, can answer any questions. Um, I, I, I guess what I'm hearing, and it, I would agree, it makes better sense to see ultimately where uh, Chris Talbot. I was about to say John Foster, but where Chris Talbot, <laughs> where Chris Talbot comes to, comes down on the uh, on the setback before we, we can proceed further. I do have one quick question, sure. which is, what is the zoning at Fairley? Zoning at Fairley, if correct. Yeah, are they two or three acre lots? It's three acre, three okay. acre lots. Yeah. R120. And they're it's R120. R120. And interestingly R120. enough, mm -hmm. those lots are because I know this from that uh, that rather significant back and forth and when my former client Scott Schleifer owned the property uh, those lots are all fairly on either side just a, a slew of non lots mm -hmm. uh, but they all take their setback from their property line and it doesn't it doesn't show up as a separate tax map so there's a lot of parallels there but we're going to wait and see how the building inspector comes out on that 
I think that's a good idea. Okay. Do, do, do any board members have any questions? Oh, 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 here we go. Here we go. I'm sorry. Uh, Bailey, thank you, Bailey, if I may, is giving me what appears to be the deed for 205B. Uh, it's a deed with uh, Chester Zelensky as the grantor and uh, Michael Jenke and Joseph Bequa. Is that yeah. in the, uh, <clears throat> is that in our, we'll submit it, we'll submit it. So okay. again, an interesting, it appears the code, appears the joint tenants are not in agreement. We can, I, I'll, I'll say that because it's obvious. <laughs> Do any Thank other you. do any board members have any questions before we'll, we'll hear from the public and then we'll adjourn for all purposes no matter what? Joyce, do you have any questions? No, none at this point. Do does anybody from the public wish to be heard? Mr. Berg, do you or let's say Bonnie can it's good to see you. Well, it's been a long time. Trying to stay out of away from these guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bonnie Cannon, um, representing the Amnesia ex Executive Director for the Bridge Hampton Child Care and Recreational Center, which is at the 210 um, Windmill Lane. And um, I came here when I heard that there were some um, discussions as it pertains to easements and that being affecting the 210. Women Lane property. Um, and basically what I wanted to say is that um, I rushed out from the children to here to say that this property means a lot to the community. Um, it has been there for, you know, historically. Um, it is probably the only black owned property that is in the biz business district of the village. And um, I know that from a zoning standpoint, this may not have a, any type of, um, as you look into the zoning rights, but we do not want any type of easements or anything that is going to inhibit us from enhancing this property, which is something that um, we are looking to do in the years to come. So I'm not really sure as far as what the application that is going forward, but if it in any way impacts or takes away from um, the rights of us doing what we need to do to keep this property and to make it useful, not only for um, you know the African American community, but for all marginalized Eastern children and family, because that's what it's going to be utilized for, then I would ask you to not do what is being asked. This is the property of 210. 209. 209, sorry. Yes. Alex, can we also just look at that in our deliberations and the effect that this might have on 209? 209. Uh, yes, just give me one moment. I'll pull that up. shrink the building envelope because mm -hmm. 209 is now fronts on uh, Windmill Lane and it would make this property which, about which the speaker was talking about more mm -hmm. restricted because all of a sudden we have a corner lot. So mm -hmm. it, it would have a negative effect mm -hmm. on the property. I think that's what Alex was saying. Yeah, you know. Okay, I'll repeat it. I, Connie, I don't we just, we just, we'll, we'll take it. We, we understand your point. We will, we will look at, we will look at it in our deliberations. We're, we're going to adjourn this for all purposes because the building inspector is taking a second look. But we, we hear what you're saying. Yeah, then that, that's basically, you know, I'm not a professional or expert on all these things. But if it's taking away from us being able to enhance and do what we need to do to this property, which some have deemed it a historic property, then um, I would ask that you not you do ever, that. Would you ever contemplate removing the structure and rebuilding on No, the we're not removing the structure at all. No, we're not removing the structure at all. 
Yep. And uh, we're working with uh, CMX. CMX Sammy is working with us. It's the same. It's going to be the same. It's just going to be enhanced. So it's going to be very important that nothing, no, no rights, no anything be taken away from it. Were you contemplating expanding it in any way or just? No. Okay. Thanks. And I don't know if the structure is a contributing building to the Southampton Village Historic District. It is a contributing? It is, yes. Okay. So it, um, any alterations would need a certificate of appropriateness from the APA or the. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Did any other member of the public wish to be heard? Mr. Berg, how are you? <clears throat> yep, glad to know. I think you have my letter now, so I'm not going to read it into the record tonight. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's relieved. Um, yeah, sorry. Jason Berg from 217 Windmill Lane. Um, so, number one, uh, Bethel Church, we would, we'd be very happy for that to be restored and used for a great purpose. So, uh, you know, definitely nothing about this. Uh, either my or any of my neighbors, uh, you know, letters, I think should apply to that in any way. Um, I think, you know, a, a lot of the basis here is we, we do want Mr. Pisa to be able to build, no one, no one is objecting to him building a one family house on this property. There's no objection to that. Uh, it's really about the size and scale and ensuring that we have access to, uh, to our homes and that it's safe given appropriate setbacks. Uh, you know, that's what we're concerned about. So I ask you to please definitely read the letter from myself and my neighbors. Uh, and, you know, the basis of that was really having read the, uh, the letter from the building inspector from November 29th. Uh, I don't practice law, but, you know, when I read the code, just simple language, it seems pretty clear to me that it was meant to be measured from the, from the right of way, easement, <laughs> private road. Whatever. I think all of those things at least I, I thought in previous meetings that we were talking about a private, that uh, the applicant was talking about it as a private road. And when I read that, I was like, okay, well, a private road is a street and this applies to a right of way or a street. Uh, if it's an easement, I think that a right of way falls within an easement. Uh, and this road has been in place for at least before, before the village code was put in place is my understanding. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically hoping that you all will look at this come up with a reasonable answer as we asked originally for, for what's an appropriate house for this lot. And as I read the letter from November 29th from the building inspector, I said, well, the plans actually don't reflect that. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that everyone was actually looking at when they think about the scale of the easement, or excuse me, the scale of the variances that are being granted, that should be relative to what is actually allowed. So whether it's uh, lot coverage, in uh, this district, uh, or whether it's GFA, as I read the building inspector's letter, it's, it basically says that it would be uh, you know a smaller home that's allowed, uh, and so it goes to. We, I think I'd be, I'd be I personally would be okay with Mr. Pisa having some level of variances on his house, uh, and if we find that the measurement is from the south side of the of the road. Uh, I don't agree with that, but if, if the building inspector or you all find that that's the case, I think it goes against the code, but if you find that's the case, then I would just ask that we keep in mind that, okay, well, we're going to have a house that's 15 feet away from the road. Is additional encroachment appropriate? Uh, and so that's that's the context that the neighbors uh, are, are coming forward with. Uh, I'd also you know ask that if you uh, think about setbacks, I think about setbacks for the cars as a safety margin for my kids riding their bikes up and down that hill, uh, and would they see a car backing out? So that that is that is what I'm thinking about when I ask for uh, there be, to be a setback for the parking spaces. Um, it's true that there is, if you assume there's five parking spaces at 205B, uh, then there's no setback. If you assume there's three, then there's actually quite a bit of setback, uh, and there's not usually five cars at 205B. Um, but I know that Mr. Janky says he's never been blocked in. Uh, I've actually been blocked in once by uh, a renter at 205B. I called Mr. Beckwar and he had to move quickly, but I actually had my entire front of my driveway blocked uh, by a car one time, but it did happen. Uh, and just to clarify on 205B, my, my understanding is that they are joint owners, but that Mr. Beckwar actually lives there. 
And the reason I never asked Mr. Jenke to sign the letter uh, or to give input on the letter is that I haven't seen him in quite a bit of time. So, uh, so that's the reason. Um, and the idea that <laughs> the idea that we coerced Mrs. Etheridge, <laughs> in, who's a really nice lady that my kids give flowers to, <laughs> and I just waved at her today. The idea that I would coerce her or terrify her into signing the letter is really offensive. <laughs> and she's a super nice lady, and I would never do that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Um, if I may, it's interesting. It seems my argument would be based upon the concerns that we're aligned. Let me tell you why. First of all, uh, there are no GFDA issues here, although in deference to Mr. Fern's analogy, we've tried to come closer, uh, taken off, you know, almost 500 square feet. There are no lot coverage issues. We don't need any lot coverage uh, variances here. Um, but you would think that... Um, and, 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 but the, the really important thing in terms of <coughs> where this lays out in terms of the, uh, the, um, the location. The Can we put that on, on the camera? Do you oh, want sure, that on the camera? Sure, sure. Which, way do, which way do you want it? Can you this way? Is it towards you? Jennifer? I'll tell you in a sec. The proposal doesn't the camera is not on. on. <clears throat> there it is. The proposal doesn't bring any of the improvements at any at, at all closer to the Messier River easements. The question is whether or not the setback is taken from the south side or the north side, but it doesn't. We're not asking you to get any closer whatsoever to the easement. I just want everyone to, to realize that. So I'm not. It's not like we're necking down the access point. Sure. You're in line with what is existing there now. Exactly. You're you're growing westward, so you you are increasing some presence on the street, but it's you're not westward. coming any closer yes. to the street. Well, it, it, I guess that's a that's a that's an interesting term of art, increasing presence. Yeah, we're getting about 300 square feet larger, but you yep. could argue that a single family residence is less presence than a two family residence, and I would think that that would that would, that would create makes sense. That would. Uh, um, yeah, so we're not we're not we're not necking down, uh, we're, we're not increasing the lack of accessibility uh, for anyone. I just wanted to, to want, to, want the board to understand that. Uh, but but um, and 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 a two-family residence, it's four parking spaces. We're going to give four parking spaces, even where we're going to have a one-family residence. We only need three. But the thought was in in trying to be responsive to the neighbors' concerns and the neighbors' concerns about cars parking. Uh, in that series of right-of-ways, the extra space is to hope to get that car off, off, off the series of right-of-ways. So, and anyway, that's, I just want to point those things out. And again, we would respect your request. Uh, John, yes. Where do the cars park now? Uh, approximately where they are proposed to. To the, to the, to the. They park to the wet the, on the southwestern portion of the property. I guess my real question is whether their location shifts east to west. Is there any um, difference in practice on how a car backs out of the property onto the road? Probably not. No, no. You can't get, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, you know, there's no room for any circular, there's no room for any articulation. That would be great, but it just doesn't, it, that's the situation that's there now. I, I don't see, I'm, I'm all ears, but I don't see any way to remedy it, to be honest with you, Luke. Have you started with the ARB yet? No, we no. haven't. No, we haven't. I, I <laughs> my client, my client doesn't like to hear this, but uh, I think he's going to be have, have to be a little flexible in the ARV. <clears throat> John, was there a free application meeting with the ARV? I seem to remember them giving some comments on the initial. Contract. Not, not, no, not, no. I don't, I don't. As a rule, uh, there's only been one in the last twenty years. I've only gone to the ARV on a pre-application. Once, because my client insisted on it. I think Mr. Peterman I like to get right. Okay. A, a while back, oh, I think oh, Mr. Pisa yeah. was in front of the ARB for a modernist home that they didn't no, love. For, for guidance. Right. <clears throat> okay. 
I, I don't think there was any surprise with their lack of embracing that particular home. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> okay, why don't we um, <clears throat> motion to adjourn for all purposes? Mark, Mark, no, 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 uh, 213 Windmill Lane for all purposes. Can I have a second? Second. April 9th. And we are adjourning to. Well, we need the letter from. We need some response in writing from Chris Talbot. Should we say April 9th, but dependent upon whether we receive That's that fine. response? Can we say that, Alex? We'll, we'll put April 9th, and if John doesn't have that letter by then, he can put in a request for a further reading. Okay, so we, we'll motion to adjourn until April 9th, case number 3151. Thank and you. Second? And all in favor? Uh, Aye. You're there, Joyce? Okay. Aye. So moving on, we have case number 3162, 146 Halsey Street. Uh, hi, it's John Bennett. John. Uh, how are you? <laughs> um, I want to make sure. Are these are correct? Just a couple of things to supplement what we um, brought to the last time. And again, this is a, um, we've been struggling to try to get this into this pool, the proposed pool, into, in, into a comfort range for the board. And the best way for us to do that is to look at other applications. And we've submitted quite a, quite a few of them. Uh, we reduced the size uh, of the pool uh, from 15 times to 15 by 28 to 10 by 22, and reoriented it. Uh, we had some concerns from a member of the Architectural Re Review Board who was appearing as a neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, originally, we were going to cut into that old garage, uh, but we've now uh, reoriented the pool so that the garage can stay exactly uh, the way it is. Um, oh, and by the way, before I forget, there's a, there's a tiny 88.6 square foot variance to just a f uh, as a fill-in on the house. It doesn't seem to have been any, any problems with that. So I, I'm not really going to address that any further than I have in the past. So, um, the, and we did show, show you that although the pool is 30 feet from the right-of-way line, it's actually, as, as Mr. Sh uh, Schiffer said, it's 52.5 feet from the actual edge of the pavement. Um, now, again, of course, you have to take the setback as from the property line, but it, it is in terms of the real world, 42.5 feet from the edge of the pavement. Uh, I don't. Sorry to stop you. Say 52.5 and then 42.5. I'm sorry. It's it's 30 feet from. My apologies. I was I was going quickly. It's 30 feet from the right of way line, the street right of way line, which is why we we need the variance. Um, but in the field, as Mr. Schiffer pointed out, who's the engineer, not the surveyor. It's 42.5, I'm okay. sorry, I said that quickly. 42.5 on the actual edge of the pavement. My guess is that Cooper Street is not, even though it's 50 feet wide, is not uh, a street that uh, you, you would see the municipality, the village uh, widening. But, so I, I give that for what it's worth. Uh, we did submit quite a few uh, variances. Uh, we also, this evening, have um, we submitted a letter of, re of support from Julie Eichner, who owns the property at 19 Cooper Street. I think we already submitted that, didn't we? Uh, and then, but just this evening, we did receive um, a letter of support from Mr. Gleason, who owns the property directly across the street at 128 Halsey Street. We are in full support of the application and feel that there will be no impact other than the beneficial ones to the character of the neighborhood and urge you to approve the application. No, I don't. I'll pass them down. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Sure. And then, I'll just, I'll just be quick because I think we put most of the case in. Um, we we've been. I, it, it's been my experience that the 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 because I only I think in. Some, 
over 30 years, I'll, I've only obtained two requests for relief from the 20-foot setback. The 20-foot setback for the pool, because it uh, it's the closest to the property lines of the neighbors, the one uh, is a setback that the board has been most hesitant to to change. Uh, there are some setback reliefs to eight and 10 and 12 uh, but for the neighbors. But I, I, I will admit, including one on the property next to my primary residence, but I will admit that those are rather old, older cases. But So the cases that we have given you, which are mostly front yard setback variances, where people have adhered to the 20-foot rear yard and the 20-foot side yard, um, We've given you only the, the the recent ones because I think that those other cases where there have been variances as it relates to rear yard and side yard are quite old. Um, but we 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 and, and the reason is the impact. It's though that's the setback that um, it, it, that the trustees uh, have used to try to lessen impact from pools. Pools are a common accessory structure in this area. I think the neighborhood support suggests that there's. No harm, no foul here, no, no detriment. We did, I know the chairman asked for uh, Alex to put a couple of variances. There were two of them. Uh, one, I think, was on 70 South Hill Street. That was located in the R40 <coughs> zoning district, uh, requiring uh, a minimum front yard setback of where 70 feet is required, as opposed to in, in this zone. Um, so that was distinguishable. But the history, and I was very involved in that case, uh, one of the rare times I got involved for neighbors, uh, um, there had been, the, somebody came in with a house that had, was originally before the A or, the a or B, with, and, and the house had a conforming pool on it. So, uh, and, and then the owner built a house with the, with the built a, a house on the lot with a pool, with a house right in the middle of it. Uh, so it was seen as a significant uh, self-created hardship because there had been a methodology to put a pool in a conforming area on that lot, uh, and uh, the owner simply chose not to. So I think the the, the zoning board was not very um, what's the word sympathetic sympathetic to that. And then there was. Um, was one at 71 Walnut Street, and that was a property owner in an MF20 district that sought to con 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 uh, construct a pool um, at 27.3 feet where 60 feet was required. Uh, and that was a 348 square foot pool. Here, this applicant is proposing a modest 220 square foot pool, 10 by 22, located 30 feet from Cooper Street where 40 feet is required. So it's a, a much more modest and less significant uh, variance. A variance uh, where you have 25%, I'm showing my age, uh, Anderson on zoning, uh, which is now, uh, what's her name? Salkin. Patty Salkin on zoning. But Anderson on zoning is at 20, I think at 25, either 20 or 25 feet is the where you hit something called, that's not a substantial variance. So. Um, We'd ask you to take all this into, into consideration, uh, and we don't have anything else to say. Uh, Alex, can you help us out with these two cases? Can you show us um, the survey on 71 Walnut Street where the board rejected the pool? And I'm not even sure it was a pool, so let's just take a look, because I think at some point they asked for a hot tub as well. Correct. Uh, give me a moment. I'll have to see if I can find it. And I think that's South Hill. No, no, I was no. doing, I was doing seventy one Walnut first. Okay, just so we we can see the, the survey. Because seventy one Walnut Street actually had a, a decision issue. It was a decision. It was litigated. It was sent back to you. You denied it again, and then they decided not to go back to court. That's the history of that case. The, the, the board's original denial was overturned by the Supreme Court Suffolk County. It went back. You denied it again. And I don't think there was any second request. And there, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a follow up 78. Yeah.
Mine's like four well. Wow. <laughs> Do I have that wrong? The procedural history? Oh, I don't know what happened. To yeah, that's we what happened. Yeah. I, I know that, that it was a different board. Julie and I were on the board, and Dan Gusevich and Kevin Guider. 20 by 18, as I, as I represented, 20 by 18, 348 square feet. <laughs> I guess it's the decision that we need. Do you have the decision, or just enter the decision in the record, Alex? If, if that's it's what on the drop box of the board review, the, the whole case file is here. Okay, so in the decision, was it a twenty by eighteen pool, or was it a hot tub that was denied? Uh, I'd have to read through it here. I don't have all that information at hand. I don't have any problem with you leaving it open just for that. So we're not taking sure. up everybody's time. No, I mean it is. I mean the decision. It is what it is. So. It is what it is. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. that's that's all I'm saying. It was a hot tub in the ground. I think I don't want to rely upon my memory entirely, but I I, I think it was a different think. board. But you would you would rely upon your memory. I, 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 I think it was a hot tub that memory. was rejected in the decision. <laughs> okay, interesting. The only the only note that I would have is <laughs> I always sort of scratch my head when people say it was a different board. You are more than the people who sit on this board. You are years and years of decisions. Uh, and um, that's, you can't just say we're a different board. You have to rely, which is why I put those various decisions in, in the property. Because this board, as I always say to people, has always been a board. Uh, the Village of Southampton Zoning Board of Appeals, which I've been proud to appear before since 1982 has always been a board that has been strenuous, studied, with one exception, well represented, uh, courteous, and uh, consistent. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're agreeing. I'm, we want to follow that precedent. At, at 71 Walnut Street. So no, I think you have to follow more than the president of 71. No, that's all. Was, that's all anyone can ask. the more recent one. That's uh, all anyone can ask. Walnut. If you can't find it, let's just circulate it to board members so we look at the final decision. Alex, and do you have access to the to the final decision on South Hill? South Hill, because your letter, John, says... Although denied by the board, a settlement agreement was reached there by allowing installation of a small pool within the property. That's that's what happened. I yeah. believe that the settlement was specifically that it wasn't a pool, but we have that settlement. I, that because I remember that the, 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 the conversation was exactly. Yeah. I thought it was a little I bit slight of hand, was. right? They looked at the zoning feature. code yeah. and they said that if it's smaller than a certain size i can't remember exactly i think it might have been eight by ten that was news to me by the way it wasn't a pool so what was finally granted was not a pool your letter does say thereby allowing installation of a small pool but the stipulation was specific that it was not a pool under the zoning code definition of a pool because it was of a size smaller than the definition of a pool in the zoning code and of a depth more shallow but yeah. In any event, there's a lot more to distinguish to that, water. as I said. There's a lot more to distinguish that case than I said because of its different zone, its different setback requirements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was surprised at that decision. It, it, it created some new standards on <laughs> whatever you want to call them, water features or pools that were a surprise to the local bar. But anyway. But that, that, is that the stipulation there, Alex? This is a memorandum from the uh, village attorney um, in relation to this case, it's a memo um, from Bob. To the contemplation of a settlement. Can you? I can't read it. What is it? The depth of the. <clears throat> does it say it's uh, not a pool? Is my is my it says point? It's in the pool. No. Correct. I don't know how, but it says the pool will be deleted and replaced by the word spa as the structure does not comply with the village code definition. Swimming pools is only 80 square feet. I believe the village code defines the pool as uh, 100 square feet of the Okay, so that was 80 square feet, and then did it speak to depth? Um, the front yard set back at that point. Which no, I, no, no, I meant the depth, depth of the, of the, the water feature. I, I can't oh, say for certain, but I think you're right about that, Mark. Yeah, yeah, I can't. 
campus. You, you, if you looked in the file, I think that was the how they got there. But again, that was that was somebody came in with a. They originally showed to the ARB. I think it was the ARB a house that had a conforming pool, and then they made it. They made the determination to center the house and make it larger. So the board wasn't terribly sympathetic. I, I mean, that was. I, I can tell you, I was on the board. That was not one of our factors. That I well, I will tell you that that's what happened. And no, I, I can tell you like, it happened. I'm not. What I'm saying is, I don't think in our deliberations with respect to. 71 Walnut Street, yeah. that any board member was saying they had a No, I'm talking about South Hill Street. Right. I was I'm talking sorry. about South Hill Street. When it came to, I read the rules. No, I was talking about South Hill Street. When it came to South Hill Street, I don't remember any board member mentioning that the property had previously had a the record and that it was a self created we'll, we'll, hardship. We'll, 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 we'll dig out the record for you if you would like for yeah, that, because or, I remember that decidedly. Or whether it's in the decision. Because well, we if it's that, in the record. Alex, we have that decision, right? For 71, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, let me not conflate it. So you have 70 South Hill Street. This is 70 South Hill Street. Right. So we didn't talk in the decision that denied the pool. So earlier there was a decision, wasn't there? There was a South decision Hill that was denied the, the water pool. feature. Yes. Right. 71 Walnut was the uh, spa yeah. in the ground. I remember. But okay. first, in order to come to the stipulation, there was a decision. Correct. Re rejecting the variance or, or not accepting re the relief. So I just want to make sure we, we have the file. Otherwise, we're fine. We have the record. Yeah, I think you have everything you need. And you have my the way I distinguish those, those cases by having much greater setback requirements than in this property. And so, I will find the record in the record because I was very much involved in it. There was a lot of discussion about the fact that the applicant had originally shown a house that had a conforming pool. But I'll, I'll dig into the record if you want to leave this, whatever you want to do, leave it no, open I, for all I mean, purposes. I, or leave it I open. motion to close it for all purposes. Oh, well, then, if, if that's well, okay hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why don't you leave it open for a while? I'll, let me see what I can find on the record no, for written submissions, if you would like. Because after all, you're going to ask Alex to put stuff in. So why don't we do that? I have a question for you. Yeah, sure. Do you. Do we have a letter one way or another from the neighbors to the north? 150 Halsey? Nope. Not one way or the other. Or okay. the neighbor to the east? Not one way or the other. Yeah. Oh, to the east? Oh, to the east, yes. To the east and, and to the south. 19 Cooper. Cooper yeah, and east and that. to the south, yeah. But as it, remember, to the north, there's no need for variance. As Kevin Guiderer used to say when people would object that where the, where the, uh, where the improvement conformed, right. you, uh, we, they're not asking for a variance as it relates to you. I fully agree, yeah. but... Yeah. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think the application is moving in the right direction. I think it was a good move to okay. try to make the existing garage work. The pool, John, seems slightly askew from the from the orientation of the house, right? Has there yeah. been given any thought to turning the pool a few degrees counterclockwise and moving it north? Well, we have to worry about keeping it five feet from the garage. But we'll take a look at it. I mean, it gets you further off the street, and yeah. it, it looks like it would abut essentially a swimming pool uh, at, at 150. Can I, as they say in Supreme, can I go? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I guess I can't. But it, it's, it's, let's put it on the camera so everybody can see. Well, I, no, I wanted Luke to show me. I just wanted him to sketch so like, it out for me, which is going to be, which is like, that's, that's the way we always used to do it. Sketch it out for me. If we can do it, I'll tell him okay. my camera. Oh, while you're doing that, okay. Um, this is the decision in uh, in um, 70 South Hill Street. The inability to con re reconfigure improvements to residence pool, equipment shed, and patio result from inadequate planning of the site. The previous application evidences the owner's awareness of site limitations and the challenge of accommodating its wish list of accessory structures had the site been reconfigured at the time of the previous application to provide a different pool location a more favorable plan may have been developed so they actually specifically did talk about that no no i, I agree memory. i agree because it was a they they were working with a vacant piece of land and we had yeah. discussed the possibility that they, that they could have created a, a house that would have oh, put I the pool. didn't have any memory of that one. i'm sorry no i, I didn't have a memory there. of of any board member considering that there was a pre-existing pool of course, when you're working with a vacant piece of land, we would be asking the applicant to find a way to not require a variance. Yeah, but what I'm saying is there was a plan that showed a conforming pool. I remember that. That's 
You know, like what if? That's, that, that's 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 I mean that's fine. I appreciate, it, but we don't meet the twenty foot. No, I know, but I, well, speaking only for myself, okay. right? not for these guys. Um, I think everyone. And I go and say, I think everyone. Um, I think that protecting the street, the front yard setback, is perhaps more important than a side yard setback. And I I wouldn't have a problem with with that layout at all. I'm also pretty sympathetic to pools on corner lots myself. But um, the the only and again the only thing and this this is one of the, one of the problems of having been before this board forever. That's the sort of application that if I had brought this in, everyone would say, you got to meet the 20 foot slide in your yard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I, yeah, no, you yeah, might be alone. You might be a, a voice in the wilderness in terms of That's saying not, you prefer it's not the first time. The, um, the street. I'm not trying, and I'm not trying to give any, any, any problems here. I mean, I can't, I think I, what you've drawn here, Luke, is like maybe a 10 foot setback mm -hmm. to the, to this, to the, to this, when I can, when I can make that. We can try to, I mean, maybe we can try to do something that picks up the extra foot. Well, my philosophy is that the zoning board um, is here to grant relief when we're talking about a property that the code was not considering when it was written, right? And this corner, house predates 1930. Corner lots mm -hmm. and swimming pools, to me, certainly deserve a little sympathy. Um, trying to help you get off the street a little bit more than maybe some other folks would have a easier time considering this. Okay, well, that would be that would be great. It's just that would be great. Right. Well, you have to ask for another variant. So I understand the hesitation. I don't care. I don't, care. I, I don't, I don't mind. Don't take it as legal advice. Don't worry. I take it for how you say it, and I appreciate okay. it. Okay. I, I, trust me, I do. I this mean, is when John would welcome a different board. Excuse me? <laughs> it's when you would welcome a different board from what's happened in the past. No, I would well, I, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. I don't know how to. Nor I. I, I don't know how to, how to calculate that. I'm not, I don't, I'm not exactly sure I know what you're saying. But in any event, um, I, I could present it as an alternative. If that's not too complicated. I don't know. Take the temperature of the. Or do rest you eliminate the, the front yard setback relief? Luke is saying push it towards the neighbor to the north right. so that it's in line with the house, which all of it makes a lot of sense. I just will tell you that the most I've ever been able to get out of this board on reduction from a 20-foot <laughs> setback as side or rear is 15 feet. Mm -hmm. And even that one was when the building inspector issued a permit for some strange piece. No, there are two. One building inspector made an issue permit in error, number one. And the other one was when, I guess, a not very savvy pool contractor, you know how in the field you you, you stake setbacks, you don't stake the actual. You need to really watch the pool <laughs> installers. So, so he, the guy staked the five mm -hmm. foot setbacks and the, and the guy put the pool there yep. as opposed to the 20 feet. Yep. I get it. You, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Mark, I'm just saying maybe if the pool were further away from the street, yeah, I mean, I don't want to redesign for them. If it eliminated the variance request, then it well, perhaps it comes under our, you know, there's another feasible alternative for them. But right. we're just still. I'd have to requiring... re You'd have to re-advertise for the yeah. side yard. What's required on the front yard right now? Forty. Forty. And we're at thirty, so we need ten feet of relief there. So in the front yard. In well, the front yard. Okay, so then you the, need so you're at thirty. You need forty. Right. Right now you have twenty-one feet uh, to the north. So if we gave that ten feet to the south, you'd be at eleven feet on the north. And what did you say you need? Twenty. Twenty. Okay. I mean, yeah, I can right split the difference. I would rather <laughs> I'm I would rather grant a variance for side yard relief than front yard relief myself. But if I understand it, you're still granting relief for both. No. Right. What's Luke saying is move the move the pool out of the move the pool north. I think you're okay on the Cooper Street setback. Yeah. Move it north. That's what I'm saying. 
We'd have to move it 10 feet and north. North, but then then we would run a foul mark of the. Oh, let, me, let me make sure I know. It's the rear yard. Run it's the one with opposite the, setback the shortest. To the north. Yeah. It's a side yard. But I mean, maybe this is all unnecessary. I don't know how you guys feel about the pool as it is right now. Maybe you're okay with it. And this is just wheel spinning. Let me see what you're looking. I mean, I. I Can you put I really it on just, the TV <laughs> screen? Oh, sure. I really you just want to, you know. Mark, uh, he has it on the yeah. TV screen. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. The application for a variance for many years was to say submit a survey or draw a sketch on the back of the application. Here it is. And oftentimes you would see, you see the most the used tool yeah. in the Zoning Board of Appeals was an eraser colloquy <laughs> <laughs> between the board members of the That's funny. Mm -hmm. See, it's a shorter setback to the north, but it's a conforming setback from Cooper Street, the way he drew it, right? Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? You did. So I'd have to re-advertise, which is fine, but I don't want to go on a fool's errand. Yes. If it's something that the board would <coughs> would consider, I would certainly re-advertise. And I could have it an alternate. It's all, oftentimes you can have alternate requests for relief. Did you say, I guess you're looking at the arrow at the back, that you have to move the pool back there? There's really not too much to complain of. Although we'll wait and see what happens <laughs> until you re-advertise. I, I think one of the things Luke was saying is that if you look at the aerial, the neighbor to the north has a pool in the same location. And so that, that diagram shows conformity with the front yard setback. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it. I shows, think, yes, well, that's what they're saying. It's, it's back of the envelope. But back of the envelope, but yeah, I mean, if, if I were designing it, I would center it on the kitchen back there to just sort of look nice and yeah, it's definitely 10 feet extra. I'm willing to say that I would be uh, willing to consider an alternative, okay. but I am not appreciating where we find ourselves right now. I don't think it's, a, I, I don't think a public hearing is where we should be going through let's make a deal. Because right. I think it's too much to ask all of us to consider this movement. You can see it very easily, Luke. Yeah. I cannot see it the way you see it. I don't want just in a conversation like this. Yeah. If I may, mm -hmm. that's sort of what you're supposed to do. Well, you can tell me anything you want, John, no, but will. that no, I am I, I am telling you that doing it at this pace, oh, live pace, like that, is I, not I'm working so, for oh, me. I fine. need to see that's it. Fine. I'm happy to consider I an understand. alternative, I but I'm not willing to come out with an opinion without having the chance to look at it. Different okay. people take in information That's different. differently. That's different. I understand. And I respect that. Yes, I, I misunderstood. So, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm, I'm not willing to be. Anything, yeah. I just want to be clear that I'm that's something I'm not able or willing to do. So why don't we adjourn it? I'll re-advertise it. Um, but I'm gonna re-advertise it for alternate relief. So that uh, I'll keep what we have here and that, or in the alternative for, for side yard relief. This is a side yard, by the way, because it's the, it, the when you have a two front yards, which is of course part of what we used to call our practical, practical difficulty. Um, if the, this was not, the street was not here, we would only we would be in a conforming location. But when you have two front yards under the village code, uh, the rear yard is the, lot line opposite the shortest. So this is a rear yard setback, this is a side yard setback. So mm -hmm. what we'll do is uh, is we'll alternate, we'll re-advertise for alternative relief. We'll try to get it on for the, hopefully we can do it for the April thing. We'll see. Alex, but, but John, just remember, remember like I, that's I know, just, is, just, I, I, I um, just. I take, I take it for what it's worth. Okay. I appreciate it. So you're gonna come back to us with plan A and plan B. So mm -hmm. then, we can either like nine of them, one of them, or both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it the same? Understand. Am I using what do you, the what same? Do you think about? Am I using the that's same fine. game show I mean, metaphor? Is it door number one, door number two, or is that a different one? Let's let's make a deal. Uh, well, it, it, it's <laughs> it's just so procedurally, we'll submit a revised plan or an alternate plan for the building department to look at. The building department will come up with the will will confirm that the setbacks are as they say they are. Brian, I don't think you can be heard. As I was saying, it, the process involves submitting the plans to the building department. They'll make a determination. 
uh, we'll find out what the actual setbacks are. Then you can submit and ask for alternative relief because, as Mr. Bennett said, if you don't have notice for that alternative relief, the board can't grant that alternative mm -hmm. relief. No, if I you think my, my question is I've not seen applications with alternative relief. Not common, but certainly uh, common in a situation happens. like this, there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly acceptable. I'll note we have until the 22nd to issue the, the notice for the April 9th meeting. So as long as we're able to issue a denial letter in advance of that, we would be able to notice it for that date. If not, if not, then it, it takes whatever you want. I just, I, I don't like the, the process of kind of guiding an applicant because I don't want you to be on a fool's errand. It could be that the board will then decide I neither understand are acceptable. That. I, understand I don't want to feel that fully. I as think, if you've been misled. I think that, that it would be, I think that want, it would, you can, you I think it would be improper it. for the board to deny either one of these reliefs. I think absolutely. I have to go to the arbitrary and capricious, but having said that, I understand and I take uh, Mr. Farron's suggestions for what they are. He's not prejudging it. He's talking about some possible alternative relief and i will tell you that that in over 40 years of doing that that is oftentimes what happens before boards so what Can do you we put do it somewhere do we withdraw this application no 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 so I mean, you, do you continue you would continue it to either april 9th or the the next april meeting date whichever it may be uh, that keeps this hearing open and then you know <coughs> if there is an alternative plan that comes in that will be incorporated <coughs> with the new notice. So we just adjourn for all purposes? Okay. Correct. Right. Okay. So, uh, let's move on. As, as a board, mm -hmm. we do have the latitude to, I've heard it called horse trading, so making crazy. a deal in an effort to minimize Absolutely. relief, right? P pace notwithstanding, and I hear Julia's comments loud and clear, but, right? So Correct. So when I say, like, I would like this application better if it didn't have a tennis court, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? then yeah. that's a little too much right? it, oh, okay, it, sure. it comes under <laughs> in the statute it provides that you are to grant the uh, minimum relief necessary to achieve the benefit requested by the applicant if in fact you are to grant relief so uh, that would come under the minimum uh, relief required minimum to be granted and again I appreciate it I understand the manner and to the extent that your comments are made Okay. Okay, so we'll motion to adjourn for all purposes. Case number 3162, 146 Halsey Street. Can I have a second? Second. And all in Thanks. favor? Aye. 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 So Aye. Moving, moving on, we have case number 3166, Stephen Kropinski, 325 Cooper's Neck Lane. How are you, Lucy? Hi. Uh, this is CEO Liu. I'm the architect for this project. I'm just going to move this a little bit. So we were in the meeting uh, back in December uh, when uh, uh, Mr. Luke made some uh, requests and also Mr. Horvitz and also made some requests and I made the uh, changes and then unfortunately a lot of meetings got canceled and the uh, last meeting and Mr. Horvitz was not here to make the comments about the wetland but I'm going to just repeat uh, what, uh, what was uh, presented last time. Um, so I did the side-by-side -side, uh, work comparison. So we're going to enclose existing porch here. And that's... It's not time. on the projector yet. Um, okay, sorry. Alex, Thank you. what folder is this drawing in? Because I don't see it in 222. Here it is. I know, I want to look at it on my screen. Oh. Um, it, is the drawing that's currently on the table? Yes. yes. And you're not talking about the one that, that's marked up? Because I think that was done. Oh, I marked it last time with the marker. But it should be. In no, just I, I had asked for like a side by side yeah, existing versus yeah. proposed so we this can see right. it on one page. Yes. But I, I don't see the application folder in this month's um, it was, Dropbox. It was put in long time ago, like probably January, wh when we were supposed to have a meeting. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was put in a long time ago. January, you think? Yeah. 125? Uh, yeah, it was submitted. Yeah. It was, January, it was okay. January. That's correct. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. 
please. Because the meeting was canceled and then there was drawing A two. Okay. No quota and no no wet and stuff. Okay. So Thank three you times. for putting these side by side. I yeah, appreciate I did it. it side by side. So um, <clears throat> this is the enclosed porch. That existing porch enclosed. This is existing porch enclosed. And then this is the uh, porch that we want to, uh, open porch we want to construct. And each is 88 square. And uh, out of the, uh, the existing porch that's gonna be, in, uh, that has a little bit of um, uh, setback relief of about five feet. We, but we are actually using the existing setback. That's, that's what that is. And then the, the really, when you look at the elevation, uh, even though I did the side by side, by side it's really, when you look at flat out, it looks the same. So it's very, very little impact in terms of the elevation. I think what uh, Mr. Workies last time uh, did say that uh, what really uh, he wants to see is the revegetation, uh, which I, uh, I, I invited a uh, uh, wetland uh, person and did the um, consultant who did this uh, recommendation for me. So we're gonna plant uh, two rows, uh, 11 plants on each side. So I'm not the, can't read it upside down. So we're gonna um, play soft rush in the front row and the Pennsylvania safe on the back row. And then I have the uh, pictures of what the plants look like and they're supposed to be deer resistant. They deers don't eat them. And these two rows, because uh, when we build, so when we look at it, we thought this is probably the most sensitive area because they got closer uh, to the wetland. So uh, existing setback, which is 51 feet, eight inches from the existing corner of the porch. And when we're done constructing the new porch, the setback is 47, eight inches. So we're like, uh, we shy four feet. So we're gonna put these uh, two rows and we gain four feet of uh, buffer. And the square footage comes to uh, 200 square foot. And both of these add together the 176 square foot. And they're actually in the existing cleared area. And they're decks, not patio. So just uh, just the, um, the post get down. So we probably need one or two posts and that will be um, the presentation. And, and am I understanding the drawings correctly? These expansions are already entirely underneath the existing roof. Uh, not the porch. Not the porch. Not the two, the two little squares that I drew. Yes. Each 88, they're not under the kind of the rest okay. of them are. Are you? Wait, did, hmm. <laughs> Okay. Because I don't see a new, um, I don't see any new. Yeah, see right here? That's it. That's it, okay. I understand. You, you well, found yeah, the it? Roof, see, the roof is already there, because right now you can walk around. Oh, no, th there is a trellis here. There is a deck, oh, uh, the trellis over a deck. Okay. There is a deck here. Right between the two orange square, yep. there's trellis over a deck. Understood. Yeah, that's where actually we propose to put a roof over. Yeah, it's in the it's in the application too. I see. I see. So, Sorry. But uh, what I'm trying to say, the new footprint, the new covered, the new footprints have mm -hmm. two orange squares. Mm -hmm. Everything else is already covered. And then this is already high roof, this already high roof, and this part has trellis over it. I see. Sorry. <laughs> I know it's kind of really hard to show even with the pictures. I mean, they 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 just look so 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 much the same. Uh, here. So we're gonna see this trellis. Yeah. No, so I fully I fully believe you. On either right. side, I want to square it. Okay. That's all. No, we, we understood that. Okay. We yeah, so presented I, that before. It has yeah. to do today yeah. with, it's, with it's I think, really, hearing from, from yeah, Mr. Voorhees about the Because you, you promised a report during the mm -hmm. week so I can I can do the 
revision to come, but I didn't get any report, so I figured I'd come here to hear in person. We're looking to you, Jim. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if you didn't receive something. I did prepare a memo that oh. was sent to the village office last Thursday, <clears throat> oh. uh, just before noon, because I like to make the deadlines as well. Um, but apparently you didn't receive that, and no. I apologize for that. No, I asked. Uh, but it was filed, and you should be able to um, receive that. Oh, okay. uh, so I'll just, I, I think it might help if I can share my screen okay. in kind of two stages here. Before we do that, Alex, can you just explain the logistics of, of how if uh, Chick provided a report to the applicant last Thursday, the applicant didn't receive it? I believe provided to the building department, and I understood that we had provided for the applicant. Um, so, Lucy, I'm sorry that you didn't receive it. I had it in my notes that we uh, we had it sent it to you. Uh, so tomorrow, I'll track down and make sure that it's going to the right place. I'm sure you elicited the contact person for the applicant, so I'm not sure why that would have been. I I actually went into the building department and asked for it too. I think Mr. Chris brought out the folder, but I don't remember exactly who today. I wrote to you twice on email, mm -hmm. and then and and then you said it was not ready. And then I went into the building department, and Chris brought the folder, and he looked through, and he said there wasn't anything. So I did three, two, two, two emails to you, and one in person with Chris. But I really don't remember which day I went in to ask Chris. I can look it up on my phone, but... Um, yeah, it may have been before we received it, uh, Lucy, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. I'm here. Okay. So this shows the property. It shows um, the setbacks that you're requesting, uh, and it shows the two rows of vegetation that you're proposing on each side of the uh, boardwalk, the wood walk. <clears throat> when I looked at this, um, I think we can do something a little bit better if you're willing to look at a um, possible alternative. Mm -hmm. I hate to horse trade here, but I'm looking to give some uh, protection to the wetlands. This green line, this dashed line, it's a little hard to see that it's green, but this line is the wetlands line. Let me just double check that. Yes. Uh, no, that's not. What? So the, the red green line. The one is a it's a, it's a scenic buffer, I believe. The wetland that is 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 marked is the red is one. Is the red line, it's okay. The red line that is swept by you. The green line is a buffer. That's, that's what correct. They, what, that they don't yep. roll along. And here's the notation here. Yes. So what I was looking to try and do is get a little bit more of a contiguous expanded buffer that would have more value from a, the standpoint of habitat um, and really expansion to buffer the wetlands, uh, knowing that this green line is the wetland line. Oh, I'm the, sorry, the red line. The red line. Is sorry. The red line. <laughs> um, and this area, I think, will be a little bit more of a higher traffic area. I do understand what you said, that it's closer to, um, the, construction, yeah. to the construction. Uh, but <clears throat> let me just, and again, this is really just a suggestion for consideration. This is the actual memo that was sent. It stated March 7th, was sent last Thursday, and it shows uh, a potential location to buffer uh, a larger area in the back of the property. Um, if you're willing to consider that, I think it would provide a larger area. Uh, it would provide more contiguous area. Uh, and because this is the scenic line, it looks to me as though the areas past this are already vegetated. So it will kind of blend in with the vegetated areas and I think create a more meaningful buffer. Um, and I would also suggest and ask that you add some shrubs uh, to the buffer area, perhaps um, marsh elder or groundsel bush. So if you did work with a consultant that knows the species, uh, they, would, they would certainly know what, uh, what to specify. Uh, but those were a couple of suggestions, and I would just ask that that be considered because, number one, it's a greater area to offset the impacts of the additional structure uh, within the wetland setbacks that are already established. 
uh, would provide greater habitat, would supplement and buffer the existing wetlands, and would be in a less high traffic area, and I think would do better. So you want us to vegetate more there with better plants? Uh, yeah, the maybe? species that you specified are fine, the rush and the sedge. Um, I'd like to see that supplemented with um, some shrubs, uh, groundsel bush or marsh elder. The scientific names are there in the memo. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like you to consider that. Again, this is for the board's consideration as well. I provided this memo just as a suggestion for discussion today. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, then I have to look at it and talk to my clients and come back the next uh, the question here is, I believe there are some um, ornamental grass that's not native in the cleared area. So you see the green line that the, the green area that you want us to vegetate, there are, I believe, clumps of uh, fountain grass. Like a fountain grass? grass? Yeah. yeah. Kind of things. So what would you suggest us to do? Um, I, I, I don't see why that couldn't stay. Uh, what I'd like to do is convert any areas that are long. Um, and I was looking at an aerial photograph that maybe I can bring up as well. Let me share. One second here. So I see what these may be areas where there are clumps of fountain grass. Yeah. Okay. I'm really I'm not as concerned about that. I'm more concerned about the areas that appear to be lawn. Uh, so I, I think the fountain grass could stay, but if you could uh, expand that area, square it off, and basically what we want to create is a um, non-fertilized buffer that would buffer the wetlands and expand the vegetated areas. Okay. I think uh, we actually, I did talk to them about it and they kind of, I don't know what they're trying to do here. They seem to enjoy that corner. So, so can you tell me why that corner is very important to vegetate? Uh, just that it provides additional um, setback vegetation habitat and is more compatible uh, with the adjacent wetlands than existing lawn areas, which appear to be throughout this area. But we're not doing anything in that corner, right? No, it's really just trying to offset uh, potential impacts related to the additional structure within the setback and to try and um, establish a more meaningful buffer and again reduce lawn area. Yeah, I think the, the reason I keep on asking is that when we were there, uh, you know, with the clients, they seem to really like that corner. So uh, is there somewhere else or do you really think this is the most important uh, corner? Uh, I provided the recommendation. I can okay. certainly look at it again okay. and um, I can visit the site again. I remember flagging the wetlands here, okay. uh, but I can, I can look at it again. Okay. Chick, from a wetlands benefit standpoint, maybe the triangle <laughs> in between the pool, the hardscaped pool, and the wetlands may help catch some of that runoff off the pool patio and also the proposed new roof. So in the area more to the north, yeah, north. Up in here? West of the pool. Right, here's the pool. Yeah, there's that triangle that's probably not used by the kids or anything like that. And we, we know we have water running off the patio. Um, and we know also that's where the new roofs are proposed. So it'll be a little bit more roof runoff there. And um, perhaps um, it would be an area that would not be as important to exactly. the owner if exactly. they utilize those areas. Yeah, we could certainly look at that. Yeah, right so it may be an expansion of what, what you have here Towards and then the going into side. this triangular area yes. if you can see the cursor. Could we look the uh, aerial one more time? I 
had mine was too tiny. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, next to the pool where there is a, um, uh, on the other side of the dock, uh, on the other side of the boardwalk, mm -hmm. I believe they are not so interested in that side. Over here. Yes. Um, of course, I'm going to tell them what you suggested. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, is it okay I contact you during the week and talk to you about that? It's up to the chairman. I know we like to have our discussions okay. here, but yeah. it, since it's uh, more technical in nature, that, yeah. that would be okay. fine. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about um, what they're willing, what, what they wish to do and what you suggest and see what they, maybe they will take what do you mean they take this? Okay, one, so why don't you talk to yeah. your client for yes. return for all purposes, yes. whatever conversations you have, if you could just provide a memo to the board that yes. you with us. Okay, so why don't I motion we're going to adjourn for all purposes. Second that. Uh, case number 3166-325 Cooper's Neck Lane. Eight okay. seconds and Second. all in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. So April, it's April 9th. We are going to... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our next matter is a new matter, case number 3170, Patricia Grunebaum. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Forty Johnson. Lisa, I think you're here for that. Yeah, no, I didn't. Was Bishop's Lane? Out. Bishop's Lane, Bishop's Lane was apparently, um, they didn't re-advertise. Oh. Uh, and we so, need to make a notice in that case. Yeah, so. they need to be re-noticed, but they'll re-notice for April 9th. Was that you too? No, 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 no. I okay. just I yeah. didn't realize I was up. Uh, before, can you address why this is before us? I mean, I, I know your presentation will be wonderful, <laughs> but I don't I'm, need to make it. I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm reading the code and, and and I see the provision that would allow you to. I, I'm looking at. Uh, 116-19C, um, I guess it's three, a non-conforming building or structure that is devoted to a conforming use, may be enlarged, reconstructed, structurally altered, restored or repaired in whole or in part, except that the degree of non-conformity shall not be increased, but you're actually decreasing the degree of non-conformity. So I'm just not sure yeah, what, I, what zoning provision we're under here. I, I am not sure as well. And I can try to shed some and, light on that. And yeah, sure. Thank this, you, Alex. The, the non conforming structure is being uh, relocated to a different location. And I, my understanding is the building inspector um, doesn't permit that without a variance because it's more than a 100% uh, reconstruction with a reconstruction in a different uh, location than it previously existed. Um, I understand that the, property, the, the zoning code only allows one dwelling per residence. This is a uh, as to a second dwelling on the residence, sometimes called a cottage, and that's what's not conforming and because it's being moved to a different location. Uh, the building inspector determined that that was not uh, permissible under that section, um, unless the board were to grant a variance for that purpose. So, Alex, the moment the cottage is demolished, the property is in compliance, and then to rebuild it would be correct. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think that's an accurate way of, of phrasing it. So then how do you interpret 116-19C3? Uh, I'd have to pull up the code um, in front of me, but are you referring to the code that allows uh, repairs to be made? Um, it says enlargement, said reconstruction, structurally, structural alteration, except that the degree of nonconformity shall not be increased. I don't believe the relocation is included in that list. Mark, what were you? 116. 19C. 19C. 19C involves a conforming use. 19C3 involves a conforming use. 2 does not. So it stays under 2 for a non conforming use. Well, no, I agree with Mark because it, it, it is a non conforming building or structure. But it is devoted to a conforming use, right? As a resident, it's a conforming. No, it says it's a conforming use. It's because it's residential. It's non-conforming because there's two residences on one property. So the use that's we argued that, <laughs> and the use we agree with you is a conforming use yes. because it's residential. 
what makes it non-conforming is that there's two residences on the one property. There, there's a lot of, I mean, we had a whole thing that was submitted that shows that we shouldn't be here, but. I don't know. But then we, but then, but then there's I been other be variances that have been issued. So yeah. So this this section one, once you hear what I'm trying to establish with mm -hmm. this group is what is our standard? What well, I mean, it's not it's not a five point. It is variance test. It, it would is. be yes. Okay, that's fine. We can do it that way. If it falls, if it properly falls under one of these sections, it would be your five factor test. Okay, and the variance is for. From what I understand, uh, from what Alex said, it's the relocation of the building. But do we we agree it's a non-conforming building, right? It's non-conforming to have two residences on one lot. So so it's not yeah. So we agree. So it's non-conforming, but it is devoted to a conforming use because it's a house, and it's allowed to be a house. No, there are, there are two. Who's, who's to say that the other one isn't the non conforming <laughs> Right? So it's, it's interesting because the, the, st the statute does not refer to a, you know, a property, it's conforming building or structure used by a non conforming use. But the fact that there's a, a second dwelling unit, yeah, that's a, a non conforming. The building needs to inspect to determine that second dwelling did not be uh, reconstructed completely and relocated. Um, yeah, but it's uh, section two directly above, right? It's not, it says a conforming building or structure used by a non-conforming use shall not be reconstructed, blah, blah, blah. But it's neither of those things. It's not a conforming building, and it's not a non-conforming use. I, I th the, the issue is it's non-conforming use on a property, not the building itself. And that's where what, what you're suggesting is the way that the statute reads doesn't account for a situation such as this. Ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Well, can we leave it that if our five-point test is that the benefit to the applicant of moving the structure you know, outweighs any detriment to the community, and we may not find any detriment because it's actually moving to a conforming location, then we could issue the requested variance. That's correct. Okay. Is there also a parking variance? Because I'm not seeing it on the notice. It's not on the notice. It's not before you. And it was part of the application. Somehow it didn't get noticed. So I understand that I'll have to. So you're going to have to re -notice. I'm going to have to re-notice. Again, I'm not <clears throat> changing the number of bedrooms, but the code says that I'm supposed to have more parking than I currently have. So I assumed, and, and I did speak with Chris about this, I assumed that I needed a parking variance, even though I'm not changing or increasing my need, but your current parking law requires that I'm not allowed to stack vehicles, and therefore, because of the location of the existing residence, I will need a parking variance to maintain the same exact use that I currently have. You want to do a presentation? Can we're I do it from here? Yeah, we're, yeah, <laughs> yeah but we here. have to be able to hear you. But can we you are still going to have to re-notice this because you need a, a, a parking variance. Correct. Okay. Can I just talk? I mean, yeah, as long as you talk into okay, the mic. They were, yeah, they were talking. Because it's very hard if you're trying to watch it remotely. Um, so as we've determined, this is, uh, uh, well, I'm Lisa Zaluga. I'm the architect for the applicant, <laughs> um, Patricia Grunbaum. And um, so this is a pre-existing non-conforming use, I suppose. Um, there's an existing two and a half story residence with a porch on John Street, 40 John Street. And the dotted line here is the location of the- So Lisa, your, not, your oh. map that you're talking to is not on our screen, so we can't see it. Can we get that? Yeah, yes. they're working on it, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> <laughs> We're just looking at Alex at the moment. <laughs> Okay, so that's picking wrong. up. Right, okay, now we got it. All right, okay. Now move the mic. Leave little rectangles yeah. on the board. Now move the mic towards you, and you're good. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, again, uh, 
this is 40 John Street. There's a pre-existing two and a half story residence with a porch uh, located here with this dotted line in here being the location of the cottage. The cottage is um, about 463 square feet. It sets about four feet off the property line, so it's non-conforming for pyramid, for a setback, as well as the fact that it's a cottage. Um, our goal is to relocate the cottage over in this general location here. It will be conforming to all setbacks. Um, the, uh, the setbacks we're proposing are 14.3 feet, 21.3 feet, and 20 feet. The we primary structure setbacks? Well, so I was going to say, so we have a 10-foot accessory structure setback, and because of our um, lot width, we have an 11.2 square foot, 11.2 uh, foot setback for a principal dwelling. So we conform by almost double in some cases. For, uh, wait, I'm sorry, you conform? I conform to both accessory, accessory and principal. And, and principal. Because okay. of four tenths relief? Because of four tenths relief. Got it, got it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so again, same exact square footage, conforming location conforms to pyramid law um, and it's been we went to the architectural review board because it was old and they determined that they would not landmark it that they they were fine with us demolishing it um, and again it's a I think it's decreasing the degree of nonconformity I'm not changing anything else Well, so it's around the corner, too. So it actually from, what street is that? From John Street, it looks like less buildings on the property. Correct. Has 82 Elm weighed in on it at all? No, I have, um, I have letters of support from 46 John Street, which is to the west here. Um, 32 John Street, which is to the south somehow. I don't know where I wrote that. Um, and 75 Woolley Street, so over here. Um, those are the only people that I've heard from. It's being rebuilt exactly in kind, Lisa, square footage-wise? Exactly save square footage. Height-wise? Height-wise, um, I'm actually slightly lower. I'm conforming to actually an accessory setback okay. height. Um, you know, this, if you look at... If you look at the aerial photo, um, this being John Street and our location being here, um, you know, there's pools in all of these backyards, basically. I think that having that structure there will actually limit the noise between all of the, you know, between all of the pools because it'll actually act as a wall there. So I actually think it'll be nice for people. They won't kind of all be screaming in the same general <laughs> location. Do you have drawings showing compliance with pyramid law relief in the file? So this is the existing footprint here of the cottage and our proposed footprint, and that's our proposed look. And that shows the, okay, that's the pyramid law. It's the pyramid right. law here, okay. here, here. Are you unable to find another parking space? <sighs> yeah. Um, the existing driveway runs along right here. Um, you know, the front porch existing 14.5 feet off the, off the front property line. Oh, yeah, sorry. Better. Definitely need the squares. Um, so the existing driveway is, is located here. And again, it's about, um, uh, you can kind of see there's a little bit of a, a shadow area where we're going to enlarge it. It's about 11 feet wide currently and probably about 50 feet long. So I'm going to widen it so that I can get two cars side by side. And those are kind of shown with those X's. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that gets me, gets me four spots. Um, I can't, you know, your code says I'm not allowed to stack more than one car. And it says that something this narrow, I can't create another spot on the other side because I can't have two curb cuts. So no matter what I do, I'm kind of, I'm asking you for some form of relief. And again, I'm not increasing my use at all. 
I'm just trying to conform with a current code that didn't exist back when this was done. Mm -hmm. well, what's the distance between the front of the house and the street? Fourteen point five feet. <laughs> a little close. <laughs> so, and it's, so the variance would be for one parking spot. The variance would be for one spot. I think there's been some conversation about that law changing a little bit, but it is what it is at the moment. Since we have to re-notice, Brian, do we adjourn for all purposes? Let me or just try and understand the parking variance. So you had par four, four spaces on there previously, or no? No, no. I had I had an 11 foot wide by 50 foot long driveway, basically. Okay. But Great. it was the same driveway that's been there forever. Mm -hmm. For the same exact amount of use, but the current, you know, that driveway law is relatively new. So at this point, I went and I sat down with Chris Talbot to ask him if he felt I needed one, and and you know, I'm not conforming to that code. If you don't think I need one, I'm fine with I mean, that. That's what I'm trying to figure out. You're not increasing the use on the site. It's the same use. You're actually increasing the available parking. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out why you. I, I mean, again, I, you know. Not in any large I, I think it's sort of the building. It's like a catch 22. Here, they, when you go in with an application, they're going to try to bring parking into compliance. Right. You try, but I mean, if you can't, I don't, you know. Then you need the variance, exactly. Yeah. Well, if you're increasing, if you're increasing your number of bedrooms, but I'm not. I hate the parking requirement. Yeah, no, I think it's silly. But I, you know, if I if I came in for a porch addition to the build, you know, to the building department to get a building permit, they're not going to tell me I have to increase my parking. The only time it comes into play is if I'm increasing my number of bedrooms. Got it. Got it. But again, that's up to you guys whether you know. I mean, unless the board is prepared to make a determination that the parking. Then yes, just continue this to the next meeting. Uh, let the parking be noticed. I just don't think we have that jurisdiction. I'd love to make determinations like that, but we don't have that jurisdiction. <laughs> you do if you had enough information. Mm -hmm. But I don't yes. think we do. At this point, I don't think we do. So I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. So out of curiosity, since I have to re re notice and stuff, is there any way to? at the April 9th meeting get a determination right then and there because I still have to get back to the Architectural Review Board. And I kind of was surprised that it wasn't noticed for the parking to begin with. So is there any way to have something pre-ready? or we issue a directive to Brian to actually have a decision written. It would be hard to do because we haven't even seen the parking variance request. So what, what Lisa's asking is if there's some way to actually have a decision written for the next meeting because mm -hmm. I think we stopped voting. We could vote, but we stopped voting without a decision. So I'm deferring or, to you. Or, or I can come up with a decision that night that I have put some thought into. <laughs> I love that and read it into the record. Okay, we'll, we'll try. We'll okay, try. I would appreciate it. Thank you. And I mean, this is the survey that is in the file showing mm -hmm. those four spots. So that's what it would be. Lisa, you would want to uh, update the denial letter so we can give you notice. Uh, I'm sorry, that wasn't included on your original denial letter, so that's why we didn't notice it that way. Yeah, I think, um, actually, I think you guys created that denial letter when, because we needed to figure out what I was actually asking for a variance for. Correct, and at the time I wasn't aware that this needed extra parking and fire. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I put it in the application, but I guess it didn't get put on that sheet. So I'll, I'll just, we'll, for right now, we'll motion for um, adjournment to April 9th for all purposes, case number 31704 John Street. Can I have a second? Second. And then all in favor? Aye. 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 Alex, you'll let me know if there's any anybody. There's nobody here, but if there's somebody that appears to be in the audience who would like to speak to this, you'll let us know. Alex? I'm sorry? I just want to make sure I'm not over overlooking anybody in the audience who wants to speak to any of these matters. Oh, on Zoom? I'm not sure I'm able to see no. that. Um, no You'll way. let us know? Okay. Thank you. The answer's no. Okay. Can we raise our hand? Mm -hmm. Patty, do you want to?
Yeah. Okay, so we will move on to uh, case number 3171, Heracles, Nevada, 240, yeah. Little Plains Road. Disappearing via Zoom. Yep. Michael. Good night, Lisa. Mr. Chairman, I'm also Thank going you very to. Much. Do you need done. me for anything Thank after? Or? No, it, it, looks, it looks like we're in great shape. Very good. Thank Thanks, you, Chair. Chair. Thank you, guys. Take care. <clears throat> See you, Brian. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Brady from Brady Design. I am the architect for Heracles Nobab. Uh, the house is located at 240 Little Plains. Um, Alex, do you have my drawings? No. I'm sorry, are you able to show your screen here? I don't know if I'm able to pull them up or not. Oh, okay. <laughs> everyone see that yes mm -hmm. okay so on the left here is a photograph of the existing house and on the right is a rendering of the new front porch that we're trying to add to the house um, the clients really want to have a covered porch so um, it gets a lot of sun in the afternoon and from when it's raining you know in this day and age we all get lots of Amazon deliveries and everything's getting wet yeah. And so it's a, this is a, just a very simple, classical um, front porch that's open on all sides. Uh, I think it would be a great improvement to the house architecturally, um, but I do need a front yard variance because right now I am at the 30 foot um, setback and this porch does come out three feet, five inches. So I, that's what I need a variance for. Uh, there's, there's a porch there now, Brian, right? No, look at the left. It's just a surround. No, what I mean is, I, I shouldn't say it this way. There are steps. There are steps there now, but they are wood, and they have completely rotted out. They um, there is no foundation under them, um, so yeah, that needs to be replaced anyway. Are you are the steps moving forward? No. The steps, yes. The, right now, there are just three steps going up, and I am putting three steps going up and then having, um, you know, a front porch area. But those steps are three feet, five inches closer to the road. Right. You're right. moving the steps. It's moving the, the steps road. three and a half feet. moving the steps out to, to give, a, get the to give a landing. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. The landing's three and a half feet wide. So it goes wide. Okay, so, so this is the only variance I need, nothing on the sides. It's just really a simple front porch. That'll give you an idea of how far it's coming out and what the height is here. That's a nice height. Mm -hmm. That's a the, you know, the front stoop is going to be to match the rest of the house, so it's Danish blend brick roof with a bluestone top. I just wanted to clarify one thing. The current steps that are there, is that is that part of the setback? In other words, do those steps have to be? Six no. feet. They're, they're conforming. They're conforming. The, the steps uh, are currently I'll, conforming. I'll add that the new steps would also be conforming. Um, steps are permitted in the front yard. It's the covered roof that requires the variance. Right. I okay. met with uh, Chris Talbot, and you're actually allowed to come out eight feet and be conforming. For steps. For steps, right. 
Thank you, Alex. That was exactly the question. Cool. Do any board members have questions? I have no questions. Right Seems wonderful, Brian. Yeah, very pretty. Cool. An improvement. Thank you. Thank you. An absolute improvement. Um, so why don't we um, motion in case number 3171, 240 Royal Plains Road to close for decision. Can I have a second? Second. Second. And all second. in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So I'll motion to okay. close. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, I'll motion to close the public hearing. Did you want to? Is there a comment from the public? No, I think he's going to let me know. Okay. If there's anybody else in the public okay. hearing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Right. And before we go, I just want to note via the three next meetings we have on the bottom of the agenda, just to confirm um, the actual house uh, quorum for those dates. Um, if there's any changes, uh, so please let us know and we'll adjust accordingly. Uh, so we have April 9th, April 25th, and what's the third date? May. Thursday, May 23rd. Is that Memorial Day week? Let me check my calendar. I think that's a good idea. It, it has yes, to precede Memorial Day week, yes, so that's Monday. It's the Thursday of Memorial Day week. I think we might be better off looking for a different date. Past Remember. history shows that we enjoy a tremendous number of adjournments just before a holiday. April 25th is a school vacation week. Mm -hmm. So Chick may not be here. I won't be here. Okay. I'll oh, note the board would typically meet, I believe it's the uh, the second April day, which would be on May 14th, which is that Saturday. Uh, I will not be here, um, but that, that date should be available. On which date? Uh, May 14th. May 14th. May 14th. May 14th is the second Tuesday. I'm in the hall. Okay. I do think if we could avoid the week of Memorial Day, we would be better off. Okay, let's go one by one. April 9th, can everybody attend? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Say, just say who is the chair. Joyce, April 9th is okay for you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'll try. If you need me, I can attend. I'll be in my room, but I can Zoom. Okay. Sounds better off. Well, it's all better tonight. with the other. Are we still in our meeting? With you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Well, I'll um, is it all right if we close the meeting so that oh, this we, all we isn't on camera? Mm -hmm. Okay. We, to, uh, Fine. we can't close, can we? He, no. Alex yeah. just said no. And Luke, you're saying April 25th might be a problem for you. It's definitely a problem. I won't be here. Okay. Anyone? April 25th, I can do it. Okay. I'm and good. You're good. And Joyce, how are you for April 25th? Yeah, I'm fine then, too. So we're looking at whether we should change May 23rd to May 14th. You're the Neither person. one works for me. Okay. Luke, are you here May 14th? 14th is good for me. 14th is fine. Joyce, is May 14th okay for you? Um, yeah, that's great. Good. Okay, so why don't, can we change the May 23rd to May 14th? Sure, I'll make that um, adjustment on the building's calendar uh, with our staff tomorrow. Okay. I mean, I can't be. You won't be here. You won't be here. Okay. Um, so now I can motion to adjourn the public hearing uh, of the Zoning Board of Appeals, March 12, 2024. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye.